Okay, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to Red Q. So the agenda is, we just want to give you a quick sense of what we've achieved over the last 18 years. Um, talk about our core business, which is the airline business, how we think we're in the best position we've been in for a long time. Then talk about how we're digitizing the airline part, you know, how that impacts costs, how that impacts um, revenue. Talk about this AirAsia 3.0, which we've seen various bits and pieces. I, I did a speech at Credit Suisse, which many of you may have seen. There's various bits and pieces in the press, but I'm pulling it all together now in a clear, succinct way, which hopefully you'll see in the presentation. And uh, finally, just driving down how data is driving those other businesses, right, including AirAsia. But probably by the time we get to the last agenda, I would have talked about it anyway. So over the last, um, since 2004, our share price has been like a yo-yo uh, all over the place. It's probably one of the most volatile stocks in, in the world, I'd imagine. And um, yet our profit has continued to grow, our business has continued to grow. We haven't really grown very much since we IPO'd. Right? When I, when I look at other airlines and other businesses, it kind of makes me wonder why we are public. But at the end of the day, I'm not here to talk about share prices, etc. In the end of the day, if we perform and we're clear in our message and we hit the results, then share price will be what, it's, what it is. But this was put up by a group of investors who saw me the other day. They gave me this slide and made me think, what the hell was I doing for the last 18 years, right? Just from the dividends we've given out, if you add up all the dividends, you virtually paid for your share price in AirAsia anyway, right? If you look at it from another way. That's why I look at it from, I'm a shareholder, I might as well own the airline and just collect dividends. With the valuation that I'm getting, I get such a great return from the dividends, right? So um, this is kind of, was, it, it wasn't me that put that slide up. It was a group of investors who came to see us showed us our stock price, showed us the amount of dividends we gave, and said, why is our share price so low? And I said, I really can't understand that or explain it. But my job is not to do that. My job is just to try and educate the market that we're worth owning. But from a shareholder's point of view, it almost makes it more sense to just collect the dividends and, and the profit appreciation. So over the last 18 years, this is a valid point that will have an impact on the digital business. We now have 260 aircraft in nine airlines. We carry 100 million people <clears throat> as a group. We've carried 500 million people, 147 destinations in 23 countries, 360 routes and 98 unique routes, right? 23 hubs and 10,000 flights a week. That's an incredible job when you think we started just with two planes 18 years ago with all the obstacles that we have faced. And I think most of those obstacles are gone. Where are we gonna go in my time as CEO? We will have an airline in Vietnam. The partner we pulled out was purely because we felt he didn't have enough financial resources to execute what we wanted to. We are in discussions with a very, very large group. Whether that happens or not, I'm not sure, but there are two other groups that want to partner with us as well in Vietnam. We will be in China at some point. I have no doubt, and I think the meeting that's happening in China right now with our Prime Minister will have impact. That, I think, will end my journey in terms of expansion. We will be in China and India. We will have the five largest countries in ASEAN. The only large country that we wouldn't be in ASEAN would be Myanmar which is certainly worth being in, but not at the present time, because the airport infrastructure, payment infrastructure, such is not there. And that would leave only Brunei, Laos, Cambodia, and the smallest country, Singapore, where we won't be represented. But again, once you have those five countries, you can effectively have mini hubs. We're the number one LCC in, in Singapore without having a license in Singapore because we can fly from Thailand, we can fly from Indonesia, we can fly from India and China, et cetera. So I think with those two, we're kind of done, right? 
So imagine what we've built over the last 18 years and the amount of people that are, are flying with us. People say, can we be a digital company? Well, we were. We started as a digital company. You may have forgotten. I saw one comment saying, well, can they be a digital company? Well, we were the first airline to start on the internet. No one else did, right? Every airline followed us. AirAsia.com was the first airline website in Southeast Asia and most of Asia 18 years ago. And many people out there were skeptical and said it wouldn't work, people wouldn't buy on the internet and all those other reasons I came up with. So when I talk about AirAsia 3.0 and I say, well, I'm going to sell other things, um, and you say, oh, how are you going to do that? Well, we did it 18 years ago. And still, after 18 years, 80% of our business comes from AirAsia.com. Okay? We were the first, and if you look at this and you compare this with Grab or Traveloka or anyone else, we have 40 million unique visitors a month on AirAsia.com. And that's only buying AirAsia flights. Once we open up to hotels and all these other things, that velocity is going to go up tremendously, right? Um, 40 million app downloads hits from 240 countries. And our conversion rate is one of the highest in the world, actually. On top of that, we were the first airline to embrace social media. No other airline believed in social media. We were the first airline to embrace uh, social media. And you can see 26 million followers in line, uh, 11 million, almost 12 million in Facebook, 8 million in Instagram, and a very fast growing, sorry, 8 million in Twitter, and a very fast growing uh, Instagram, and so on and so forth. 1.3 million in China. And actually, in all the brand awards, we either come first or second in terms of brand recognition from a social point of view in China. And we're not even in China. So that shows the kind of power of the brand that we've built. Okay? Um, <coughs> ancillary, back in 2008, was 9% of revenue, is now 21% of revenue. And obviously, that plays a big part in where we're going. There, there are two parts of ancillary. There's flight ancillary, and there's non-flight businesses and non-flight ancillary that we're going to build in AirAsia 3.0 in becoming this digital uh, company, not just an airline, okay? I just want to highlight our operating statistics, which you just got, which shows the robustness of our airline, right? Load factors up, um, fares, I, I can't talk about fares, but you'll see that in a few weeks' time anyway. But basically, demand is strong, despite adding a lot of capacity. Some analysts, uh, particularly one analyst, was saying last year, too much capacity, too much capacity, too much capacity. Well, we filled the planes up because we wanted to grow market share, which we have. And then the two countries which are constant uh, problems in your eyes, which I said will take many years to fix, but will be very strong, is Philippines and Indonesia. So Philippines, I always said, if you go, people who've been following me for a long time, I always said this is our diamond in the rough. This is going to be as strong as Thailand. So watch this space in the first quarter and you begin to see that my prophecy was right. Indonesia, despite, and we like the fact that Traveloka and everyone removed us. It strengthens AirAsia.com. Indonesia will make money in the first quarter and is on the ascendancy. It's for the first time in my history of owning this airline that Indonesia will grow the most of any Air Asia airlines. We will add five or six planes this year. More than Malaysia, more than Thailand, um, and more than Philippines. Right? So we're very bullish about Indonesia, and we're super bullish about the Philippines. Philippines sits on the doorstep of China, Korea, and Japan. Right? And the government is very open and very liberal, so we're very, very optimistic. So we have very, four very strong ASEAN airlines for the first time. And you've seen it in the numbers, in the, in the passenger numbers. And you'll see it in the financials in the first quarter. On top of that, um, India is now becoming a little bit of a surprise for us. Obviously, with the demise of Jet Airways, 
our investment in India is now looking to become profitable much quicker. And again, we're looking at adding more planes in India, and international is not far from starting as well. So a profitable domestic business plus a very profitable international business, because all those Indian destinations can just fly to Phuket, Bangkok, Singapore, uh, KL, with no cost, because we've built the infrastructure already. All the religious tourism that can happen between ASEAN and India um, is just ready now for exploitation. And Japan is still work in progress. It'll take us another year and a half. And that's, oh, we would make money now if the regulator would give us approval for planes. So I think we're on the last bit, and then we can scale up to five or six planes, which is the economic order that we need in order to make money. We can't make money with less than six or seven planes, okay? So I mean, I won't go through this, but I just want to highlight to you that demand is strong and we're seeing even stronger demand in the second quarter. Okay, so when many people criticize us in the fourth quarter, they never understood, and I, I explained and I explained and I explained, and our share price went down a lot, that it is, we're not a quarterly business. I brought the planes in to have a strong 2019 and a strong 2020, to build market share. Digital companies are given so much credit for expanding. But the public markets criticize us and look at us on a quarterly basis. So everyone gives Anthony Tan at Grab and Traveloka, they're losing billions, yet everyone says, yeah, they're expanding, they're building, they're building traffic, they're building destinations. Well, that's what we've done for 18 years, and we've made money for 17 of the 18 years. Yet Grab's valuation is nine billion, and if you take the analyst with the lowest valuation, we're at one, one billion. Right? So go figure that, as far as I'm concerned. Traveloka is worth double what we are, and they're burning cash so much, yet they're given credit for expanding to Thailand, losing tons of money in Indonesia, losing tons of money. But here, we, we are building a, a huge business that is very profitable and expanding, yet we're criticized um, on those things. So it does make me wonder about being public. So, a quick look at our growth over the next few years. Um, I asked Azita to add it in, but she hasn't been able to. But if you assume that at today's planes, we're about 100 million passengers, by the time we get to 500 planes, we'll be about 500 million passengers, right? That will make us, even if you take the growth of, only three Chinese airlines are bigger than us in passenger volume. Air China, China Southern, and China Eastern. But per my projections of their growth and our growth will be the largest airline by about 2024 in Asia. Right? And imagine China has a huge advantage of 1.3 billion people in their country. Yet we will be larger than them by 2023. Okay? Think again of how much Grab has invested to get their customers, almost 9 billion. And look at how much we've invested profitably, cash flow positively, to build our bigger customer database than theirs. We take our first 321neo in, in July or August of this year, probably slip to September from, from uh, what Riyadh is saying. And you'll see this slide. That fourth quarter growth was all about taking market share. And that's what we've achieved very well um, in the Grown market, plus also taken market share. Okay, so digitizing the airline, let's just focus on that first. What does that mean? So we have all this data everywhere. The first job that has taken us about two years to do, where we've used Palantir, we've used Google, etc., was getting our data into a format that could be used for cost saving and revenue. So we're almost there. The, um, uh, on the operations side, we put in formats, we have 20,000 sensors on the aircraft, and that data will be coming to our data team that will analyze it and we will save money on spare parts and all that kind of stuff. Tons of operational data. We're now working on a huge project with Google where we estimate that we will save 4% fuel burn in the hundreds and thousands of parameters. Even a simple one, if I give you, certain planes, because of their age, 
burn more fuel than other planes. Yet, we just put the planes wherever we feel like putting it. Now with machine learning, the data department will tell us for this plane, put it on this route, which burns the least amount of fuel. On the route that burns the most amount of fuel, put the least fuel efficient plane, the most fuel efficient plane. The hundreds and hundreds of fuel saving exercises that we've been doing now, but it all had to get that data into position. We've got weather data, we've got all kinds of data that's coming in now, and the algorithms and the machine learning is now putting that all into place. By 2020, we will get that. And there are hundreds of cost-saving things that we are doing, which I think will take 10 to 15% off our cost by the end of 2020, okay? On the revenue side, all that data we have got is very rich data, much richer data than ride hailing, uh, et cetera, because we know spend, we know things that they do uh, on ancillary, we know hotel spends, et cetera, et cetera. We are now personalizing that and personalizing offers. You'll see AirAsia have never done promos, have never done um, personalized offers. We've generally just sent an email out to everyone. We've now learned from the data companies, as you'll see later in the presentation, we've hired people from that industry, and so we'll be much more proactive in filling up the plane. On the other side, we now know people's ability to pay for a ticket. So someone may get a ticket for 50 bucks, but we know he paid for a ticket at 90 bucks. And so we have a new system that will adjust fares dynamically on the spot in terms of maximizing revenue, which we're just signing. So lots of revenue incentives, lots of revenue enhancement, lots of cost savings on the airline. The third part of digitization, which you may have read bits and pieces about, is making it nicer to fly on AirAsia. So very soon, if you have no bag, you will never have to see a check-in desk, and you'll just walk through with your face, right? That's happening in Sinai. We have just about to launch the program publicly where we ask you to register your face on our app, register your passport, and you'll be able to register your visas on there. So you don't have to do document check, apart from one or two countries which still require us to see the visa. You'll be able to walk through. And you know, on certain airports, Malaysian airports is not included, but I think it's gonna change very soon. Um, it will be all bag drop machines, and we're even working on a self bag drop which means that you can just um, never have to tag your bag. Sorry, the, uh, a permanent bag tag. Your tag will be on your bag all the time. We know you, we know your flight, so it'll automatically change to where you're going. So we're working very hard on making it easy to board, which will, of course will improve our NPS, which of course has a positive impact on um, our revenue. The other thing is we're wi fi all our planes at a very fast speed now. There was a lot of resistance within the company uh, uh, who didn't see the value of the cost, now value of the investment. Now people are seeing a huge value. So by end of 2019, 70% of our fleet will be Wi-Fi. And most of it will be with KA band, which is very, very fast. We have the first KA band now. I haven't tested it, but everyone says it's incredible. And we're not gonna make a lot of money from Wi-Fi, that's not our plan. Our plan is the rich data that we can capture, plus as you see from AirAsia 3.0 in a second, the ability to sell and to personalize offers to you while you're on the aircraft, right? If you think of a retail outlet, there are not many retail outlets with 100 million people on their airline or in their shop for an average of one and a half hours. We can really do a lot of e-commerce without irritating people in the right way. Uh, going forward. So this slide is just to show you of all the data points we have, collecting it all together and then using it now for cost saving and using it for revenue enhancement. And the third pillar is to use data to make it easier to fly with AirAsia. We're even working on a big project with Immigration Malaysia and Thai Immigration so we pre-clear people so you don't have to stand in queues. If you're pre-cleared, you just walk through one line with your face and you, you're through. You don't have to get, meet any immigration officers. We, we told the governments with the amount of data we have, for 5% of people that you're worried about, you're making it hard for 95%. And so this is a big ASEAN project, but it's starting with Malaysia and Thailand going forward. So digitizing the airline is using data to enhance revenue, using data to save cost, 
and um, using data and technology to improve your customer experience on AirAsia. And I think we're at the, in Asia, we're right at the forefront in terms of uh, making the user experience a lot better. So these are the things I've just mentioned, um, and I'm sure uh, Azita will send you this presentation anyway later on so you can go through it, but basically I've verbalized this slide already. Um, our two partners at the moment, uh, we have Palantir that have helped us and put all the data together. They're a contractor. They probably won't be with us forever, um, but Google is a long-term partner and we're one of their strategic partners, so they'll be very, very crucial in terms of our work and we have a fantastic data science team. And today, later on, um, I brought to you some of the key people in AirAsia uh, for you to meet and interact. Uh, most of them are sitting at the back, but our CEO of BigPay and founder of BigPay is here. Uh, the man who's going to run AirAsia.com, Spencer's behind. Our head of data science, uh, Kongwei, who is probably the first time I proudly took him to most of the cabinet ministers. First time we've managed to persuade a Singaporean to leave Singapore and come and work in a Malaysian company. Um, and he was the head of data science for Grab. So it shows you that people like him believe in our vision and we got a lot of people from Expedia uh, and a lot of great people joining our company because they really see the potential of what we're trying to build, a very inclusive uh, system. And uh, later on, Pete, our cargo head will come down uh, and I think that will cover most of the new people who you haven't met. So, <clears throat> uh, I've always said this, cost is still our number one priority. Just want to highlight one slide is airport charges, where, um, and exit tax and all of these other things, right? So airport charges, um, you'll see that Indonesia just announced a low-cost terminal where the airport tax is half of Terminal 3. Uh, Thailand uh, is going to build Utapau and make that a budget airport. Clark is in the Philippines, will be a budget airport, and they're opening up a lot of other terminals. Uh, you'll see from this operating agreement there's going to be privatization, there's going to be more low-cost terminals, there's going to be more low-cost airports in Malaysia as well. So ASEAN is ready for low-cost travel. It's taken me 18 years, but we're finally at a position where we get it. And again, I think the battle for exit tax, um, the government is now re-looking at everything because I'm showing them the growth in tourism is a much better way of adding GDP to the country than taxing. The initial thing was tax, 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 but oil has gone up, income is better, so we're looking at a holistic approach to tourism and growing tourism as opposed to taxing tourism. And tourism is now the second biggest GDP in Malaysia and it's low hanging fruit. So I'm very optimistic on two things. Philippines is also about to remove its exit tax for Filipinos, right, which was put in by President Marcos. That would remove the last ASEAN country with any form of exit tax, which would mean Malaysia would be the first country in ASEAN to, to put it back. You'll see it's been delayed, delayed. I'm optimistic that common sense will prevail and that the exit tax won't be there. Already it's been halved and there's so many exemptions coming in, you know, exemption for Hajj, exemption for religious tourism, exemption for SMEs. In the end, it will go. So initially, everyone was very bleak about the budget. I think now people are seeing cash growing and oil price growing and growth is the better way. So I'm optimistic about two things. The rest I've talked about, or well, one more I'll just talk about, uh, is one, the reduction of airport charges is definitely coming. Definitely coming. And I believe there will be a low-cost terminal here. It may not be owned by Malaysian airports, but there will be a low-cost terminal here. Privatization of airports are happening all over ASEAN and charges are coming down because people want volume, right? And uh, as I put in my Twitter, congratulations to Indonesia for being the first to actually say they have a low-cost terminal, right? Because people are seeing the reality. It's not Tony Fernandez and just whether you like him or don't like him. The reality is low-cost travel is outpacing the growth versus full service, right? You know the statistics. I don't need to tell you that. If you compare the travel market, and it's not just AirAsia, it's all the you know, Lions and Scoots and all these other airlines that are out there that are growing by number, 
that is the way people are traveling short haul, and so governments want a slice of that. So it's going to happen. Now they realize there's a low-cost industry and a full-service industry. They're now beginning to understand that they need low-cost airports and full-service airports. And airport owners that see that will benefit, and airport owners that don't see that will fall behind, right? And the last thing I just want to tell you about is I haven't mentioned is Agile. That is, we're, we've changed the way we're working. We've learned from the digital companies. When we started at AirAsia, we were far ahead in thinking from Malaysia and Singapore and all those other airlines. But the digital companies are much more advanced than us. They're smarter, they're nimbler, they're quicker. And so we have adopted our organization structures much more like theirs, where we don't have functionality so much, but we're much more product driven in terms of our organization structure to be quicker, to be leaner, to be more efficient. And I think um, you'll see more and more agile organization within AirAsia uh, going forward, right? One AirAsia, we have two constraints in AirAsia. One is we have many countries. So over the last two years, we've worked on this one AirAsia project, which has taken a lot of cost and bureaucracy out of the business. And that's still an ongoing project, but we're about 50%, 60% there. Um, we're doing many more uh, things together. And now Agile will break down functionality and will be much quicker and much more adapt at responding to this digital revolution that's happening uh, going forward. So we've talked about the airline. We've talked about the growth in the airline. Uh, we've talked about how data will drive ancillary income more because we'll do personalized offers. We've never done a personalized offer to some, we know now someone has flown on AirAsia and never bought a meal. We have to keep reducing the price so that they try it. And then hopefully they'll continue to buy it. You know, we will, know, we will tempt people with duty free. With all that data, we can do really, really personalized offers. So ancillary is definitely gonna grow. We know someone has never tried a hot seat. We know someone has never tried to uplift their baggage. There's tons of opportunities with personalization that we can do now. We know if someone's traveling with a family of four, we can offer a personalized food offer for them, right? We have tremendous margin in that. But I'm trying to drive down everything, the price. The pressure on Santan is to bring down the price so we have more volume. Our average for ancillary over the last 18 years has been about 35%. We've now got to move that to 50 and 60%. Data gives me the ability to do that, to start driving people more and, and learning from the Kong ways of how they did it at Grab and learning from Amazon. We, we know now how to personalize offers to get a bigger uptake, right? So what's AirAsia 3.0? So we have the airline that I've just spent half an hour talking to you about. It's in a strong position. We have uh, four airlines that are firing. We have a bonus in India. And we got Japan, which is still work in progress. That's still losing money. Um, but that's only a matter of time. Again, I go back to my comment that Grab and Traveloka and all these tech unicorns are given huge credit for building market share. But for us, we are criticized for trying to build an airline in Japan and losing money in, for five years, right? But look at how much money Grab has lost over six years. So we've got the airline. We're going to take the airline. We're going to make it more efficient through One Air Asia. And we're going to make it one, more efficient through agile structures. And then we're adding this data into growing our revenue and reducing our cost. So that's AirAsia, the story. Uh, where are we going to grow? China and Vietnam are my two targets over the next uh, two years. Okay, so there are two more pillars to this strategy. And uh, we've talked about the airline. The second pillar is ancillary, which I've kind of talked about, in-flight ancillary. The third pillar is really this AirAsia 3.0, which I've talked about, you've read a little bit about. But today is a very succinct structure, right? So I'll start with AirAsia.com where you know, we were building all these different bands, Big Live, Vidi, this, that, and I woke up in the morning and I thought, well, why are we trying to spend all this money to build a new brand and acquire people when we have the biggest 
one of the biggest websites in Asia, AirAsia.com, right? Which there's 16 billion ringgit, but only of AirAsia tickets. Right? So the point now is to open up AirAsia.com and become a travel super app in the first instance, right? So the first question you'll say is, well, who's going to buy um, hotels on AirAsia.com? Who's going to buy other airlines on AirAsia.com? Remember, Amazon started selling books and now is selling cabbage, right? Uh, Grab started ride hails and now they're going to give you a loan. That's been accepted. It's all about marketing. It's all about branding, right? And that's something we're good at. If you put an offer out there, then why not? If you have a good payment infrastructure, if you have a good loyalty program, um, there is no reason why people won't buy for us. Will other airlines sell on us? Absolutely. We already have 22 airlines ready to sell with us, right? Why would I sell against a competitor? Why not? Don't tell me anyone in this room is just not going to airage.com and buying the ticket. You're checking with Kayak, you're checking with other websites. Internet has made pricing transparent. So why not sell? And if another airline's better than me, we deserve to be kicked anyway. We would have lost the sale anyway because you would have gone to Kayak or Skyscanner or directly to that website anyway. So go back in time and remember when I opened up the academy to third party, right? Many of you sat there and said, oh, how can you let your competitors use your academy? I said, why not? They're going to train somewhere else. If they don't, I might as well make some money from them. And we built a fantastic academy business, right? 70% was our competitors. So we will drive a lot of business. It's not my main drive selling airline tickets, but and I don't think many websites make a lot of money from airline tickets anyway. It's just drawing tickets. It's drawing traffic. But hotels and all the other things which I'm going to show you is where we will make tons of money. Right? So Erasure.com is going to be our super travel app. And one day it could be a lifestyle app as well. Right? But for today, we'll only just focus on it being a, a travel app. So if you look at the whole ecosystem, you have travel from AirAsia.com. You potentially have lifestyle with our loyalty program and AirAsia.com. You have big pay, which I'll talk to you about. And you have social commerce uh, and our cargo division. All of them are interrelated. And right at the end of the presentation, I'll come back to this slide and show you how they are symbiotic and what a powerful ecosystem we are building. Okay, I'll save it for the end of the end of the presentation. We're all about hiring the right people. You can have all the great ideas. If you don't have the right people, then we're kind of screwed. I think it was a big coup for us to get Conway. Uh, we are uh, getting some really more good people. We've hired people from Expedia. We're hiring people from Traveloka. We've hired a lot of really good people, and more and more are coming. We opened up our Bangalore uh, Tech Center, uh, Varun at the back, who I think would be very interesting, interesting for you to meet him and talk to him, is our head of people and talent, and he's been instrumental along with Irene in driving this, this talent forward, right? Big Pay has an incredible team. Chris, who doesn't look very impressive, has a degree from Oxford and Cambridge and went to MIT, and he's hired a really top-notch team uh, with him. So the incentive to join AirAsia is huge. And I've always said in all my presentations, the key is to get the right people uh, into the organization, right? So this is, uh, which will be launched, I think, in the next few days. Spencer, when is it going to be launched? Huh? Next year, it's my birthday tomorrow. So if anyone wants to upgrade our stock price tomorrow, uh, because it's my birthday, I will gladly accept that gift as opposed to any monetary or physical gift. Um, but I, I think between today, tomorrow, day after, we will launch our, our new website. 
This will be the first iteration. There will be uh, a few iterations from there. Uh, but you'll see the main drivers. We won't launch with the flights. Hotels, where we have our deal with Expedia till early next year, and then we're free to do what we want. Um, holiday packages, we will restart AirAsia.go, and there'll be two types of holiday packages. Uh, one, the bulk standard, three days, two nights kind of thing. The other one will be thematic holidays, so you know, uh, whether religious holidays, walking holidays, uh, et cetera, et cetera, thematic. Activities, which is um, like Kluk, we will compete with Kluk, and again, we have huge power to get the best activities, from the Thai snake farm to Disneyland in, uh, in Hong Kong or Japan, etc. cetera. Uh, insurance. That, that goes, but insurance will probably re be replaced with flights and holidays. From our uh, A-B testing, we're seeing now that many people want to combine their flight and hotel, sorry, uh, just together. Because, and we have the ability, because of our flight inventory, to give you the best deal from flight and hotel. I don't think anyone can give it cheaper than us. Uh, when you package a hotel and you package a flight together. So we're seeing many, many people want that option. And finally, our shop, we're now getting a 1,000 orders already, and we're about to announce two huge airport deals, deals I never thought would actually happen in my time, where people can buy duty-free and pick it up at the airport. So again, airports, this is the first time airports like us, because the more they sell in the airport, the more commission they get. Retailers like us, because while they're giving some of their commission to us, they increase their footfall. So if you buy a Toomey bag from us, or if you buy a watch from Michelle's family, then um, you may get the watch from us. She has to give us some commission, grudgingly, um, but she's losing weight, so she should be happier, as I am. You may not notice it, but there's a lot of muscle. And, uh, but you, when the passenger goes to her shop, the chances are she could sell them something else as well. So you're increasing footfall, right? So for the first time, airports and shops like us, right? So our shop, where we've been quietly working and working and working, is going to be a huge earner from us, already doing a 1,000 orders without two big airport deals, which we're about to announce soon. Okay, uh, And on top of that, our shop has developed a home delivery service. So we have seen a lot of people, we're not going to be Lazada, there's no point, all those guys lose tons of money, but we're going to take products that people aren't selling. So we've seen one of the, we see what people buy when they go to Vietnam, or where they go to Korea, or where they go to Mecca, etc., we will sell things that no one else is selling. So our top seller for home delivery is prawns from Saba. I don't get it. I don't understand it. So our shop is going to be a very powerful duty-free marketplace and an interesting, if you know this website called Etsy, um, check it out, an interesting marketplace for food and health primarily and a little bit of fashion, right? Again. We've seen some great jewelers in Indonesia. Kamerudin has great jeweler friends in Turkey. All of these guys don't have access to our 700 million market, right? So it's going to be a very interesting shop. And when you're on the plane, on Wi-Fi, and you've got nothing else to do, because we don't have in-flight entertainment, and we never will, um, it's a TV shopping channel, right? You'll be browsing through your website and seeing stuff we, you can click straight away because you would have registered big click, right? And it's just one click to pay. And if you register your face, you'll just pay with your face. You begin to see easy to pay, easy to buy is what we're working towards um, going forward, okay? So this, this slide is showing you the ASEAN internet economy market as of today. It's 72 billion, right? And the online travel space is 30 billion, of which AirAsia is about 30%, 10% of that, right? 10% uh, of the online travel space, just selling our own tickets. 
Right? If you begin to see in 2025 where this market is going to 240 billion and where we think we will be represented in this market, you know, and we put in beauty because we've tested it out with City of Haliza. We've tested it out with uh, celebrity style products. We have very good looking crew, men and women. We can build our own sea channel. We have our shop. We have our own duty free. So we can get into all of these verticals. This one is our first stop, right? So if you just take Azita's number and, and assume we maintain 10% of the market, we're having a G GBV of 24 billion. So this just gives you an idea. And it's there. All these valuations for all these tech companies are based on this theoretical, I have this market to go to. We're in that market, okay? Right now, we have the customers. And we're not burning cash. Everything we're building is almost cash flow positive. Big Pay, which has already 500,000 customers, we built for less than $15 million, right? And could be cash flow now if we wanted it to be, right? So, you know, our shop was built with 2 million ringgit and is cash flow positive already. AirAsia.com, we don't have to spend anything. Uh, well, Spencer's salary went up a little bit and we have to pay uh, some developers, right? It's in $1 million market or whatever. And we're ready to make money on that straight away. We don't have to acquire customers. We don't have to spend loads on the brand because everyone knows AirAsia.com. Everyone's coming into AirAsia.com already, right? The SEO is already done. So this is the huge addressable market that we have out there. So big pay, I've, I've talked to you about at, at length. Um, what are the big pay revenue models? We're not gonna make money from e-wallet. That's not our interest. We wanna be a digital bank. Why is an airline or a travel company owning a bank? You'll see right at the end in my last slide. So big pay is gonna be focused on remittances. Who are the biggest users of remittances? Migratory workforce. Bangladeshis, Filipinos, Indonesians, and many people here. Kong Wei, going back to Singapore uh, every week. Chris is a migratory workforce from the United Kingdom, um, and so on and so forth. They all need to send money back, right? So our target market of remittances mostly flies with us, right? Um, and not just at the B40 level or whatever, at all levels, people are, are flying with us, right? Two, point of, um, the next one will be lending. We're about a few weeks away from getting our lending license, okay? Who are we gonna lend to? First step will be point of sale loans, right? What is that? You're flying to Mecca, family of five, maybe it's gonna cost you 50,000 ringgit, okay, with everything included and we're gonna be Sharia compliant. So we will have Sharia compliant loans, we will have normal loan, point of sale loans. We will give you a 12 months to pay back your loan at a reasonable interest rate. We're not talking about raping the market, okay? Um, and you'll see later from Cargo, Chris will be able to provide loans to Pete's business, which I'm gonna to talk to you about, which is social e-commerce in a second. So it's all interlinked, right? And of course, after point of sale loans, we can, we can give uh, SME loans, we can give um, working capital loans, and of course, we can give personal loans as well. And we're gonna start that off with AirAsia staff to see where that goes, right? But you'll see in my final slide, the ecosystem is completely connected and the customer's already there, okay? So if you haven't got big pay, please download it. Please try it. You'll see what a great product it is. Benji, who is my assistant, is somewhere here. Is Benji here? Right. You can talk to him about it. He's the stingiest guy in this office. Right. And he only uses big pay because it saves him exchange. He can manage his money. And very soon, AirAsia staff don't know this, but once Bank Nagara approves it to 50000 then uh, all staff salaries will be paid into big pay. Right, except Cameroonians that will need 20 big pay accounts because 50,000 isn't enough, or we cut his salary. Okay, 
So, uh, final couple of slides. Pete is there. Um, actually, why don't you just, I'll just introduce you now. Uh, Kongwe, that's Kongwe. The, can, can you guys come to the front? I might as well just introduce you now, then you can talk to everyone later. Uh, Kongwe is head of data. Pete is head of our cargo business, which we're about to rename Teleport. Um, Spencer is uh, head of AirAsia.com. Chris is Big Pay CEO, and Varun is our head of people uh, out there. So, are we missing anybody? I feel like we're missing someone. No. Oh, no, man, that's our shop and stuff. So, later on, I mean, I don't want to make them like models, that you can choose one for the day. <laughs> Who would you choose? Oh, Pete, for sure. Uh, <laughs> looking at all of them. <laughs> But later on, rather than just hearing from me, please spend some time. And, you know, Conway has a wealth of knowledge. Chris has single-handedly built Big Pay. Pete, as you're going to see, is building an incredible business in the cargo side. Uh, and Spencer has the huge job of AirAsia.com, and he's doing a fantastic job. And it's worth talking to Varun because we've invested a lot in getting talent. To get Conway, which Irene did, was a fantastic coup. But um, uh, Varun's been really, he's under pressure because we're always asking for more and more and more people. But the response has been good. So when I finish this presentation and finish the questions, I really think it's worth you spending some time with these guys to understand it from their mouths as opposed to just mine. Okay, thanks guys. Um, so finally, Pete's, we have the best cargo infrastructure of any airline, including the cargo airlines. DHL, FedEx, whatever other three initials that are out there, right? What's the other one? TNT. I think they've gone now. But, or you, um, there's one more, isn't it? United or uh, UPS, right? They've all got three initials. So we have belly space. We have tons of cargo destinations. Remember the first slide where I said 390 routes? We have the most frequency. So. There are two business models we're after in cargo. The first thing Pete did, though, was while I was focused on one AirAsia, one AirAsia, one AirAsia, our cargo was anything but one AirAsia. Every airline did their own cargo. It was not together. It was dysfunctional. It wasn't very profitable. So Pete managed to buy up all the cargo space and is now we operate as one AirAsia cargo system. Right, so if you want to send a good from Xi'an to Bandung, you just do it on Pete's system now. Right? And just by that simple one air Asia, and this is one of the better examples of one air Asia, he will double his revenue from 206 million to 400 million this year just by selling the cargo as one. And now he's going on to buy and combine other airlines' cargo. Right? So you'll see in the press today, he has just done a deal with Oman Air. He has done a deal with Air New Zealand. You know, uh, and there are a few more being cooked right now, which ex just grows our network of being able to offer. Air New Zealand by itself hasn't very many places to sell its cargo. But by joining with us, all those sheep can now go to those 186 destinations for you to enjoy your lamb curry as fresh as possible, right? Um, and I missed out South African Airways as well. So that list is going to grow and grow and grow, which will make our cargo system that more interesting. So what does this mean? The first business we're going to do is we're going to try and cut out all these middlemen. If you go back to 18 years ago when I started AirAsia, we talked about, uh, well, we, well, you weren't there, but I talked about not working with travel agents. I wanted to have a direct relationship with the customer. And today, 18 years later, we still have 80% of our business direct with our customer through our website. So we're trying to do that on cargo. And we have three already uh, users of that. What do we offer? If you look at the right-hand slide, if you were to use a traditional cargo agent, it could take you 138 hours. With Pete's new system, you can do it on the same day within 12 hours. And we've done it, okay? The first big customer to use us is Zulig Pharmacy. And that's not a small company. They're using it for their life-saving drugs, uh, the first bit to test that out. 
So if someone's having a critical operation somewhere in our network, they use us to deliver it the same day and hopefully save their lives. So you can see that's a, that's a big ask. They've tested us out, they've looked at us, and they're using us. Yesterday, I was, or two days ago, I was downstairs. I saw we were delivering goods for a Malaysian snack food company called Amazing Grace, which make all kinds of weird durian, peanuts, and all kinds of crazy things that I can't eat anymore. And we're delivering that to Singapore on the same day. And then I saw a Fashion Valet using us as well. So more and more companies are going to come direct, which means more margin comes to us. They are happier. They get a direct service, and we cut down the, uh, the length of time. And of course, we have a better margin. And more importantly, we get to use our belly space more effectively as well. So that's the first part of our business. And we're renaming uh, Pete's business to Teleport. I had nothing to do with the name. It's uh, Pete's idea, some Star Trek thing. But again, a brand is a brand. It's how you market it, right, at the end of the day. And this is what I'm really excited about, which is social e-commerce. There was a great article in, I think it was a Forbes or Economist, uh, which vindicated this slide. I took this slide from Pete's presentation. I think I sent it round to some of the key management staff. Was it Economist? Yeah, it was Economist, right? That wrote that the largest... Um, no, it's Bloomberg Business Week. The largest um, growth in e-commerce is social e-commerce. For those of you who don't know what that is, that is all that stuff that you see online, on uh, Instagram, uh, on Facebook, etc. It is these. From my wife is selling Korean face masks, which Rosman is buying every day because to make his face look better, because he always looks miserable. And uh, I'm buying medicine from Rosman's wife to make me lose weight. There's a huge amount of this social e-commerce that's going on right under our nose. It's a huge amount. Um, Instagram and Line and Facebook have created tons of little entrepreneurs. But they're in-country entrepreneurs. And if you go to Publica on a Saturday and Sunday, you see thousands of these little retailers who've created great little businesses, right? I met one of Riyadh's friends who was selling charcoal to make your teeth white. A bit late for me, but, you know, uh, definitely late for Din because he smokes 10,000 cigarettes a day. But she said that she could make Din's te teeth white. Let's see. But I offered her, when you go to this social e-commerce, it generally directs you to a phone number or an email. And then you've got to write that email, they've got to write back to you, they've got to send you credit card details. Then that person has to pick, pack, and ship. What Pete is doing is not a marketplace, but a listings, right? So my wife can list her Korean face masks on, well, on her Instagram. She'll say, buy at Teleport. Click at Teleport, you'll find her face mask, and you just pay, all we do is we offer payment services and logistic services. She doesn't have to worry about that anymore. She doesn't worry about payment, she doesn't have to worry about logistics. And as a third service, she could link in with Big Pay to get an SME loan, right? Uh, because our share price is so low, my wife cannot get any money from me. She has to borrow from Big Pay. Okay, so she can, and I'm sure Chris will reject her anyway, but she could get an SME loan or a working capital loan or factoring, right? So you begin to see the whole cycle, right, of cargo logistics, of financial services, and Pete now offers the charcoal seller a 40 million database, right? She can start marketing not to just Michelle who's got nothing else to do on a Saturday because she's already downgraded AirAsia stock. And so is walking around in publica, avoiding me. Uh, she can now, uh, we can market to her directly, right? Rather than she sees the charcoal there, she wasn't there, we can market to her and say, we know your teeth are really yellow from your picture. <laughs> are they yellow? Let's have a look. Oh, very white. 
no need for charcoal. She's been to Korea. Uh, so we can market to her the charcoal toothpaste, but you get my meaning. I mean, we're not going to check all your faces and send you charcoal paste, right? But you know what I mean. Suddenly, the charcoal seller in Publica, who only gets the people on walkthrough traffic, can now get AirAsia's database, right? So everything is linked. And that's why our ecosystem is, is very, very powerful. And this is probably the best slide that I didn't do this, Azita did this. And that's why it's great having her because she understands the digital space. And so she's married the digital understanding and what we're doing at AirAsia into things I wouldn't even thought of. We've talked to you about the size of the market. Now think about the acquisition. Look at the number of customers we have, unique customers coming us to us every year. Some of them are double counted, but it's the same for Grab. Grab and Gojek have spent 10 billion to get 35 million active users, right? Uh, Razer and VNG, who I never heard about, some gaming company, have spent 164 million. Tokopedia and all those e-commerce companies have spent 7.9 billion US dollars to get to, to that size. Traveloka, who I think are very smart, by the way, apart from removing their revenue re repertoire from, I mean, their tickets from us, and call me every day now to please put their inventory, our inventory back on Traveloka, have spent 700 million, right, in the online space. Of course, booking and all these people have spent tons. Look at our financials, and we're, we're gonna show you, we're redoing our old financials, where you'll see how much we're spending on the digital company. We will separate out in our new financials, AirAsia, the airline, the digital companies, right? So it'll be very clear for you to see how we're growing and where we're coming from. Some of you say, well, it's hard for us to write about it because we can't see the numbers, right? So first quarter, I have all the CFOs here, um, apart from Patra, who's receiving some award. There's Mien from AirAsia X, everyone's favorite airline. There's Hanif from AirAsia X as well, if you want to talk to him, investor analyst of the year. Shame about the share price. Uh, <laughs> Wiping, etc. So they'll and Lavinia. So they'll explain to you about the um, they'll explain to you about uh, the accounts going forward and MFRS 16, which is the dumbest, dumbest accounting policy ever. Um, makes no difference. I'm a cash person. I don't care about these policies. I look at how much cash I've got, which I can dividend out and I can use to grow. Right? Accountants can write all these stupid policies which some analysts get their knickers in a twist about, but it's non-cash, right? It's not cash, hasn't affected my cash flow at all. It's a stupid accounting provision, so we have to pay Price Waterhouse and Ernst & Young more money because they got to audit it, right? I'm an accountant, so I can say that, <laughs> right? It's the dumbest accounting principle I've ever known in my life. So look at our cash flow. That's how you should value this company. How is our cash flow growing? How are we able to give dividends, et cetera? Because that's the bottom line, right? But what's the balance sheet and what's the cash? And what's the ability to generate cash? That's what AirAsia has. We're growing. We're not losing billions. We pay a dividend. We've got tons of customers. Um, and we're very positive cash flow wise, right? Take aside selling of assets and all that kind of stuff, OK? And that just gives you an idea of our visitors, our daily activity versus Traveloka, Expedia, Grab, and Gojek. I think Gojek is a fantastic company, right? I've been studying this tech side. I think, you know, Grab, if someone gives me nine billion, I can do everything as well, right? But Gojek is a lot smarter. They've taken one and a half to two billion. They're a lot cleverer. I'm very close to them. I've learned a lot from them, right? Um, and I think Traveloka is good as well. I rate them. I rate them. Um, but we're bigger than them. And then look, they're worth four billion. They started what five years ago, and uh, we're two point three billion. Okay, and so on and so forth. Expedia was our partner. We think we can be as big as Expedia in Asia now. That's why we sold our shares. You'll see my strategy do the academy, sell it off. Um, the GTR, our ground handling, will be the next that we'll sell off once we reach a size. 
So we'll be very driven on the airline business, not worrying about all these other ancillary businesses, right? Expedia, we did the joint venture, we learned from them. We didn't rush into digital like everyone else's. We stayed back. We just learned and learned and learned. I met a fantastic guy just now, um, Potboy. You should support him. He, he does online groceries, right? Um, with four million ringgit, he's built a fantastic business. We learn from all these kinds of people and maybe we help them going along the line, right? Uh, so the digital business is about cash accretion. It is not about cash depletion, and we can do it because of our database and because of our infrastructure, all right? And that's it. Thank you very much.